Okay, um, finally, DVT and youth culture. Um, this is one of those topics where what you do is you take everything that you've looked at in youth culture and you apply it to the question. Um, there's very little new content here. There is just a significant overlap um, from the rest of the topic of youth culture. Uh, any students uh, looking at this who've also studied crime and deviance will find a vast overlap. But what you'll need to remember um, and keep in your mind if you are doing the topic of youth culture, that you need to focus on particular examples that have looked at relevant youth cultures. Uh, whereas a lot of times uh, people uh, who have studied crime and deviance as well overlap far too much and start talking about crime and deviance from theorists like Merton or Hershey, let's say, from a functionist perspective, who don't make any mention of specific youth subcultures or youth culture. Um, so you've got to be very careful of that. Starting off with a functionist perspective, I mean, you go to traditional functionists that we've looked at so far, Albert Cohen and his idea of status frustration. Um, you've got Walter B. Miller, focal concerns, uh, and then Eisenstadt's idea that youth culture acts as a safety valve, where with peer groups you might smash windows, uh, small acts of fighting or vandalism that will prevent you falling into a state of anime, and more serious acts of deviant delinquent behaviour. For Miller, for Cohen, um, the breakdown of those studies appear in the class topic, uh, and for Cohen uh, in education as well. So I'm hoping you're familiar with those writers. Um, for our Marxist perspective, again, all it will take you to do is go and uh, go and look through the Marxist um, uh, video. Um, the CCCS are the writers from the Centre Con uh, for Contemporary Cultural Studies from Birmingham, um, and they are all right from a Marxist background, all focused on what Stuart Hall called resistance um, theory, which is where youth subcultures that are by their very nature deviant, uh, and in these cases delinquent and criminal, um, exist as a form of opposition, as a direct and conscious act of resistance against capitalism, capitalist values, and also the situation that they've been put into, which is, you know, a crisis of capitalism that we'd have said in the 70s and the 80s, where there is riots, uh, there is closing down of factories, there are low wages, there's unemployment, there's urban decay, um, there's all of those problems that are kind of existing and uh, have been created according to the Marxists and their perspective and the working class people there through this crisis in capitalism. So all of those writers are applicable and what I will be doing is focusing on specifically deviant and delinquent subcultures here um, such as skinheads, um, Clark, punks, frith um, and you know within those ideas about deviant dress and behaviour such as bricolage um, you know the punks and the safety pins are, are a good example but stick with the the actual um, youth subcultures that are deviant and delinquent. Um, obviously here you've got specific youth spectacular subcultures from a working class background. When you're looking at the functionalists, it's quite broad strokes of encompassing youth culture as a whole or very broad ideas of just working class groups um, in there. Whereas obviously for the Marxist, you've got specific subcultures that you should know and be aware of. From an interactionist perspective, uh, obviously labelling is going to be the cause. We start with an act and we move on from there. Becker's idea of labelling, the process of the act then getting labelled, uh, internalisation of that and acting it out in a self-fulfilling prophecy, then it becomes your overriding characteristic, your master status before you end up on, upon a deviant career, is something that can be exemplified through Jock Young's study of the hippies, where they start off with smoking marijuana and after the involvement of the label in the press and the media and the police and the general public of dirty, lazy, druggy, internalise that, get to a smaller group and the end culmination is an isolated group of hippies taking harder um, class A substances. Um, you've also got from an interactionist perspective as well the impact of the media on deviants. I used this one here, Stan Cohen's Mods and Rockers is a good example. Uh, obviously you could use from a slightly Marxist perspective as well, Stuart Hall's study of policing the crisis. All of those moral panics will work to highlight deviancy. But remember, potentially the difference here is that um, you know, we're talking about the media making things appear worse than they are. So in a way, creating the deviance through the deviancy amplification kind of spiral, um, rather than necessarily blaming the, the subcultures or the groups themselves for their deviant or delinquent behaviour. It's more the fault of society as a whole for giving out labels or the press as a, as a, as a group or a moral entrepreneur who are you know, distributing what is right and what is wrong to these 
um, to, you know, to the general public, ergo the police behaving differently towards them. Uh, feminism is a good one to discuss when it comes to deviancy because you will have some options to say maybe women are less deviant and then you've got some more modern ones saying that actually maybe the deviancy levels are rising. So um, for some of our feminists we'll be looking back at maybe what you could argue more outdated studies um, such as bedroom culture by McRobbie and Garber uh, where girls are stuck and restricted to being at home hair and makeup, talking about boys and reading Jackie magazine, potentially that's what could be going on there. Uh, and the reason for that is, as Carol Smart said, girls face higher levels of social control. Um, but we are talking about the 1970s here, so many people might argue that's an outdated um, kind of study, although Lincoln's redone it and found that there's still the same kind of thing going on as bedroom culture, but it's now all done through social media and, and online, so he calls it internet culture. But Past um, 1980s, you get this resistance to the patriarchy kind of argument coming through from girl gangs, Campbell Denscombe, from Ladettes, Carolyn Jackson, from New Wave girls studied by Blackman. So you've got these groups that exist to challenge the patriarchal norms in society, uh, where gender convergence, that overlapping of the roles between men and women, that blurring of the two genders exists, particularly in girl gangs, according to Campbell. Um, and we're seeing a lot more deviant and delinquent behaviour here. There is that argument and debate that you could have, and remember, even the, the, those who've studied girl gangs, such as Thrasher, and also Labour and Hunt, would not be agreeing quite as much with Anne Campbell that the girls are taking part in the same kind of violent shooting, drug dealing behaviours as the men. So there's a lot of evaluation that you could have there from within that kind of feminist gender argument. Um, here's a couple that you, you probably um, I've not come across before. We didn't haven't looked at these when we come from a postmodern perspective on youth, because mainly postmodernism is talking about consumerism and the effect on neo tribes of you know loose groupings. But for postmodernism, they also look at young people and deviants. Uh, and what they would suggest is, according to Katz and Ling, that essentially emotions are the cause for delinquent behaviour. So all of these are blaming usually a structural factor like you know, capitalism or the patriarchy or blaming the impact of labelling from a, uh, you know, from a society who was vilifying a particular group. Whereas for Katz and Ling, they would say, well, actually, deviance is just done as a lifestyle choice because it's fun and it's thrilling. Ling comes up with his concept of edge work, uh, which essentially means that deviance is risky and we like risky things. We like risky things that might end up killing us, like a roller coaster, because we like that adrenaline boost. And what could be more risky than burgling a house? Because if you do that, you're risking your body, but you're also risking your, you know, your, your social life and your freedom. So perhaps young people are doing these things, as Katz would say, because crime is seductive. And doing crime in young groups of people is just a seductive thing to do. Um, it's fun to break the rules. The rules are there almost to be broken. Final person that I would talk about is David Matzer, who's really not a subcultural writer. He's, a, he's, he's kind of like a critique of all of the writers that have come before, because what he would say is most of these writers don't account for the way that you can shift in and out of groups. OK, they mostly talk about subcultures as though they are rigid. You know, you, you're a punk on a Wednesday morning and you're a, still a punk on a Saturday night and you're gonna be engaging in those delinquent behaviors all the time. For Matza, he says, well, hang on a minute, crime is quite an individual thing more than it is a group thing. Uh, and the reason for that is that we all have these subterranean values, these underground values that live underneath the surface, like almost like the seven deadly sins, like wrath and envy and greed, all bubbling under there. And they spew forth out of the top of this volcano um, more frequently when you are young, so you can get some control over your life. Um, but when they spew forth, what you have to do is you have to practice techniques of neutralization to justify those behaviors to yourself. You might say things like denying that there was a victim, denying that you were responsible for the act that you've done, to normalize it to yourself and to make you feel like you're a, a good person. And these techniques of neutralization, when you've exhibited an individual subterranean value, allow you to drift in and out of criminality and criminal subcultures, which nobody else really accounts for. They're very rigid in their idea that you're in this subculture and then you're going to do this. Whereas Matza's idea of this kind of individual drift in and out accounts for people, you know, being part of a, I don't know, a hooligan group on a Saturday afternoon at the football, but then the next day go into 
a university lecture, then the next day, you know, dealing drugs, then the next day going to a family party and being absolutely, you know, taking part in normal aspects, um, conformist as aspects of life as well as the delinquent and the deviant. So he would go against what um, a lot of the others say. But that's a quick rundown. And again, note, there's nothing here that we won't have looked at before. It's just an application of your knowledge to the question and pick the ones which you know the most AO3 points about as well. So that as well as comparing ideas as you go in an essay, um, you would also have, you know, criticisms within there about, I don't know, the, the, the frequency of moral panics in a modern society, about the fact that, you know, interactions don't explain where the app comes from, about the fact that some of these are male streams, some of these are ethnocentric, um, you know, and, 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 and as many as you can come up with to, to put embed within an argument as well as just have ideas going between each.